when you were a kid growing up, yeah. you wanted to be Danny Kay mm -hmm. and, and Bob Hope. So look, how do you think this thing is working out so far? Back. <laughs> well, I knew I wanted to stand up and, you know, and be silly and have people say, isn't he cute? Isn't he cute and clever? And that's what, all it was, was a reward, a psychic reward, you know, when you're a kid and you find out that you can get the attention of adults and approval <laughs> and a little bit of respect and, and you just hunger for it, you keep going back for it. And, and I have, fortunately, genetic, you know, my little toolkit, my genetic toolkit I was given included a mother and father who were very funny people, could do accents and dialects and tell funny stories about what happened on the bus that morning and have a punchline. So, it, uh, you don't lick it off the rocks, they say in Ireland. So I thank, I thank my grandmother's milkman, actually. <laughs> you never know where these things go. No, you can never tell. It's interesting, you know, as, as I watch you now and, and through all the years I listen to your albums and things, your fascination with language mm. is so apparent. Watching you work is, is almost like watching a musician. You know, the way you, you weave words and use language for emphasis and, and all that. Was that always a fascination for you, even as a kid? Well. Well, uh, to, to go backwards with the question, don't forget what we do is oratory. It's rhetoric. It's not just comedy. It's a form of rhetoric. And, and with rhetoric, you, you, look and you listen for rhythms. You, you look for ways to sing at the same time you're talking. And to go, and it's just natural. Um, my grandfather, whom I never knew, uh, was a policeman in New York at the turn of the century. And he was an uneducated man, self-educated. And he, in the course of his adult life, he wrote out the, the works of Shakespeare by hand because of the joy it gave him. That's an obsessive young man. Yeah, and, 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 and most everything is genetic. And, and my mother cared a lot about language. And my father was a champion public speaker of 1935. He won the mahogany gavel. Over 800 other public speakers from the Dale Carnegie Public Speaking Institute. And uh, he, was, he was great. I never knew him either. Wow. That's something. Were your parents put off by the direction that you went into when they, you started to go counterculture? Was it a difficult transition for them to watch? Well, he was out of the picture. He, uh, he was brilliant, and he was a top salesman in advertising, but he couldn't metabolize ethanol <laughs> efficiently. So. <laughs> he was given his hat. My mother was very brave. She left, she left him. I was two months old, and my brother was five, five years, and she left down a fire escape. So he was gone. She, my mother, was very kind of controlling, wanted to control my life, and was, was heartbroken when I began with the dirty language and the awful stuff he says about business. She was, a, she was an advertising executive secretary, loved the business world, thought it was just the finest thing that ever happened. And so when I went in that direction at first, very opposed, until one day we lived on the same street that I grew up, uh, that I went to school in. I went to school on the same block I lived on, something like that. <laughs> Corpus Christi School, and the nuns were great. It wasn't a typical Catholic school. It was a, an experimental progressive school that didn't have grades, didn't have any sort of corporal punishment. It was just very, very wonderful school. And the nuns, she would see the nuns in the street, and they would say, oh, we saw, we saw George on, uh, on The Tonight Show. And she, being a bit of an actress, she would say, oh, it's the awful language, sister, the awful language. And one of them said to her, no, 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 you don't understand. He's using it for other purposes. He's not just doing it for that. It's kind of like part of what he does. Don't you understand? It's this and that and so forth. So she said, oh, well, uh oh. And from that day on, she was OK with it because the church had approved it. <laughs> so that was that. That's how that worked. People who deal in, in content that's on the edge, as you do, oftentimes live a life that's similarly on, a, on an edge. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people go off the rails, yeah. and we lose them and their talent. And you've been able to not do that and been able to pull it back in and... Yeah. Uh, Another luck st stroke. You know, you've got to have luck in this world. Part of it's your genetic makeup, that's luck. And then uh, what you do with it is also partly genetic because hard work is genetic. The, the desire to do hard work, the willingness to work hard and be determined and not be, set, not be turned aside, that's all genetic too. Uh, it can be altered and a little reinforced, but some of the people who, who had so much edgy promise 
they died young. I mean, Lenny Bruce, uh, Sam Kinison, Andy Kaufman in his way, sure. Freddie Prinz, John Belushi, Bill Hicks. Right. And it's just, I don't know, of course, Bill had a natural disorder of his own. I think so did Andy, but, but it's not always behavior, but sometimes it's just genetic. But um, it, it's just that uh, I think there's a degree of luck and, and intellect involved in giving up things that hurt you. The, the drug and alcohol thing, it seems to me, comes down to this. Drugs and these things are, are wonderful. They're wonderful when you try them first. They're not around for all these millennia for no reason. First time, mostly pleasure, very little pain, maybe a hangover. And as you increase and keep using whatever it is, the pleasure part decreases and the pain part, the price you pay, increases until the balance is completely the other way and it's almost all pain and there's hardly any pleasure. At that point, you would hope, then the intellect says, oh, oh, this doesn't work anymore. I'm going to die and I'll do something. But you need people around you who can help you and you need something to live for. You have to have something to look forward to to bring you out of it, you know, because there are a lot of people who don't have a lot to right. live for and they're, they're sort of stuck in the Was there ever any fear that by giving up the drugs you lose a bit of the genius by giving yeah. up the wild lifestyle, sanity being the well, enemy? Well, that that's, that's, has been a canard for, for a long time that, uh, that most of this creativity comes from being wacky and I'm sure there's a lot of truth in that uh, as far as just being plain old wacky. <laughs> where, where the drugs are concerned and alcohol, they do seem to open a window for you. They do seem to broaden the vistas at first. The thing you have to do is learn when, you know, it's like all these great writers who became drinkers. Uh, you, you have to sort, like, uh, I find with, like, with pot, I'm not a big drug user anymore, but I have always a joint somewhere <laughs> near me. I don't, you know, hidden. Might be hidden. Might be hidden. And what I do, and I, and I hardly touch it maybe once a month, that would be frequent for me. But when I'm writing something, and I write perfectly straight, perfectly sober, and I write a whole lot of stuff, six, seven, eight, nine pages, and I really pour it out, the next day, one hit is all I need now. <laughs> one hit, and it's punch-up time. <laughs> <laughs> time to get this thing going. <laughs> and you do find, with that sort of judicious use, I find there's some value in it. But, but most of the things we use, don't let you leave them alone. They don't. Pot does. Thank goodness for that. Well, that's excellent. What? Sorry. You can that's applaud it. if you wish. That's, uh, that's more than fair. You can more than applaud. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Why do you still care? Why do you still care enough to keep you at a point in your life where you could go back, you could do your month in Vegas and Florence Henderson could open up and you could go and, and hit a couple of balls and then some pinball? Yeah. Why do you still care so much? Well, I'm not comparing myself to any of these people, believe me. But you wouldn't say to Picasso, when are you going to put those brushes down? Get rid of the canvas, you've done it. You know, you, right. I'm an entertainer, first and foremost, but there's art involved here. And an artist has an obligation to be en route, to be going somewhere. There's a journey involved here, and you don't know where it is, and that's the fun. So you're always going to be seeking and looking and going and trying to challenge yourself. So without sitting around thinking of that a lot, right. It drives you and it, and it keeps you trying to be fresh, trying to be new, trying to call on yourself, call on yourself a little more, you know? And willing to put up with the grueling yeah. promotional schedule and everything else. The, you've got, the you only know, way. Picasso never had to do morning shows in Albuquerque. <laughs> right. You know? And the only way I can do this is to go where the people are. I can't, they will not come to my house. <laughs> We've offered bus rides and everything. They will not come. I have to go to Stevens Point, Wisconsin, or wherever it is. And the audiences are great, uh, and they buy the tickets ahead of time, and they really wait for you to come there and see it. In the theaters and concert halls, it's special, because the audience, they do it beforehand, and you're the whole evening. In Las Vegas, you're an afterthought. You're an also. Well, we could go gambling, we could go hookering, we could get drunk, we could go to the convention. No, let's go see this guy. <laughs> and if they like you, they do, but they're not committed fans. So it's a different tone there. But it, it still works. You can still do some things there that, that you can feel good about, you know. Do you feel your place in comedy now? Do you feel the, you know, because we've been spending a lot of time at the festival and everybody that I would mention, you know, hey, I'm going to do this uh, George Carlin tribute and their, their faces light up. And, and to a person, really, Carlin? And can I meet him? Is he around? Do you, do you feel that place? Is that an, well, you know? Well, that is growing on me. I think, you know, longevity is a wonderful thing. They, 
Sometimes you get applause just for not being dead when you say, <laughs> it's true. When you say, I'm going to be 60, they applaud that. Wonderful, <laughs> not dead, 60. Uh, so, but, but I'm, I'm getting a sense of it. You know, when you're in planes three days a week, I go out every Friday, I come home every Monday. It's three different cities, three different nights, airports, hotel lobbies, and people are wonderful. People, I love individuals. I hate groups of people. I hate people who have, a group of people with a common purpose. Because pretty soon they have little hats, you know? <laughs> and armbands, and fight songs, and a list of people they're going to visit at 3 a.m. So I, I dislike and despise groups of people, but I love individuals. Every person you look at, you can see the universe in their eyes if you're really looking. And they're great, and so cumulatively I have gotten the feeling that I'm in this big family. A family life I never had, by the way. This, so to say, extended family of people who feel like you're their cousin, you know? It's like, Georgie, 1961, I saw you. Hey, remember that? Yeah, oh, and you know what you said? And I said, did I? Oh, yeah. So it's, you know, it's just great. And, and so cumulatively, you say, well, I guess I'm in the family. I guess it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you think, does it boil down? <laughs> After 10, HBO hours after a multitude of, of best-selling albums, after Grammy nominations, mm -hmm. after Emmy nominations, after Cable Ace Awards. Does it all boil down to what you had said originally, that it's about, hey, dig me? And that's hey, saying, look at me, ain't I cute? That's it's all, it's just a job is called showing off. And if you can get them to not only stop and listen, but say, isn't he cute? He's real, you're cute. If you can get the approval. See, I, in our school, we didn't have grades, so we didn't have A's, B's, and C's, and D's. The only A's I got, and this is a little corny, I got their attention, I got their approval, their admiration, their approbation, and their applause. And those were the only A's I wanted, and I got them. You I certainly have them. mine, sir. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just want to say that uh, I, I can't tell you enough what a pleasure this has been thank for me to spend some time with you and uh, to be a part of this show. And thank you very much for all it's the, been great the to wonderful food. to know years. you a little and you are going to show us a lot, and I look forward to it. Thank you very Thank much, you. sir. I appreciate it. George Carlin, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.